And good morning, everyone. Happy July 29th, 2021 with our episode, It's Always DNS Numeronyms. It's a hard word to say. <laughs> and right to repair. That 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 came out. At, that was hard. Hardest, hardest part of the day already done. Um, so <laughs> um, my name is Mason Egger, and these are my hosts who are going to introduce themselves in no random order. <laughs> I'm Kim Schlesinger. I'm Chris Sev. And I'm Matt Cowley. Woohoo! And here and we are. Like the most <laughs> formal introduction we've ever done. Yeah. Worked out well. I, I <laughs> One day I'll actually script what we're going to say there, but today was not that day. Um, so good morning, everyone. Where's everyone coming in from? Drop it, drop in the chat and go ahead and say where you're coming from. What, what part of the world? What country? City? If you have GPS coordinates, that's impressive, but I don't think we need them. Yeah, um, please don't give us your GPS coordinates. It'd be a little bit creepy, but... <laughs> yeah, and while we're waiting... We have a really good Hello World today, I guess. Um, this was actually in one of our meetings, and I'm excited about it. So uh, if you had your own late night talk show about tech, who would you invite as your first guest? And we'll start with Matt, because he's the first one that made a noise. Oh, I, I had completely forgotten this was the question once again. Um, my brain instinctively goes towards Cloudflare people, because... I love the company, um, and they have such an amazing view of like the internet as a whole, right? Because that's what they do. They see everything on the internet. Um, so yeah, I guess like Matthew Prince, maybe, if you want to have more of a business side of tech, or uh, John Graham Cumming, who's their CTO, if you want kind of a more in-depth tech look at a lot of the stuff. Um, I think both of them have been in the industry for a long time at the top of Cloud Fair. I think they'd have a lot of very interesting things to share. Yeah. Um, hey, everybody in chat, Ryan Olson, Canada, Robinson from Kenya, uh, Polina all the way from Manchester. Very nice. <laughs> Woo! Uh, Adnan from Pakistan, uh, Garish from India, and Open Expert. I, I think I'll go next because Open Expert kind of took the answer. Woo! And this is this is like the, the cheat answer, right? It's like, <laughs> I'm starting a show. I want the biggest person in the world on the show. <laughs> <laughs> see i don't like yeah but he's such a bad speaker like whenever i've watched him like give interviews or like tech demos i'm like someone get this person some acting classes <laughs> yeah but that's the that's the charm of it right like it's it it isn't marketing it isn't any of that it's a legitimate tech person saying tech things it's charming yeah. for five minutes and then it starts to starts to great yeah, yeah i like very it. much <laughs> very much so um, I don't, I, I don't know who I would invite. Um, I don't know my first reaction and I'm going to get a weird look from our moderator in the background on this one. Um, I actually would invite Moise Yaretsky because one of the co-founders of DigitalOcean, because he has a very <laughs> big personality and says some pretty interesting things. And I think the entertainment value alone of what he would say would yeah. just be fascinating. Like I've, I've, I've been in one meeting with him, um, and I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> like he's blunt and he'll tell you exactly the way Ooh. it is, but it was just, it was, it was refreshing. And I'm like, this person should have their own talk show because I, everybody would tune in to watch it. Um, But yeah. Okay. So tune army captain says Corey Quinn. That would be a fun one for sure. Yeah, um, Corey's, I'm, Corey's if I want to get, <laughs> if I want to get my feelings hurt about all the things we're doing wrong. Um, yeah. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. It's been done some fire already. If you bring Corey on. Yeah. Definitely. So Chris Chris expanded my mind about who you could invite to our theoretical talk show because I was thinking <laughs> like people I could actually probably get a conversation with. So when I was thinking like that, I would love to talk with Charity Majors, who's I think she's the CTO of Honeycomb. Um, but she is uh, really opinionated, um, like has a lot to say about observability and deployments on Fridays and testing and uh, I always appreciate her her um, opinions, even if I disagree with them. But if we're going big like Elon, I would love to interview uh, Jaron Lanier. He uh, was like the father of VR. Um, he works at Microsoft now, but um, hmm. he's one of those people who has like that 
ninety thousand foot view on tech. Like, where have we been? Where are we going? What does it mean as a human being to have a computer or to interact in virtual reality on your own or with other people? So, um, yeah. Well, anyone else in the chat have someone you'd like to interview? Well, um, Toon Army Captain says, "Go crazy, get Freddie Mercury." I don't know what his contributions to tech were. <laughs> Um, but I would totally be down to have Freddie Mercury as a guest on a, on a host. <laughs> I would also, um, also be down. That would be, that would be amazing. So, <laughs> uh, Eduardo's coming in from Mexico city. Uh, Shahid is coming in from earth. Very specific. So, <laughs> oh, um, we did have Mars last week. So we did, we did. No, yeah. Really good thing to clarify. I'm really Was looking forward Shahid to all the also? other ones. <laughs> Shahid's uh, planet hopping. Yeah, I'm just glad. I'm I'm just glad that. So, out of curiosity, you know, like when you you do like in the at least in the United States, you do state comma or city comma state, like Austin comma Texas when you're writing your address. Shahid here did Earth comma Milky Way. Whenever we're writing intergalactic addresses, is, is that, that the convention? same? Is, is that the same format? Do we have to put planet comma mm. galaxy? That's a good question. I don't know. Does that work? I don't know. That would be. Interesting. I mean, like. In, in, in on Earth, right, we have a reasonably standardized postal system, and you can write an English address, and it will generally make it anywhere. Yes. Aliens don't... Well, I'm assuming here, but aliens probably don't understand <laughs> English. Maybe. Who I, knows? If, I bet you they understand. If they made it to space, uh, language is not the problem, I think. I would <laughs> imagine. I also like we've made it to space again. God, we always do this. It always goes up. God. We always we always land on space on this show. Uh, <laughs> Fabian <laughs> Fabian says hello from Madagascar. That's really cool. Oh wow, yeah. 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 I do want to call out Ryan Olson said he would like to interview Adam Waffen. Waffen. <laughs> yeah, from, Tailwind. from uh, Tailwind. Ryan, that would be one of my tops. Right. Adam's always fantastic. Uh Big Tailwind fan over here. <laughs> I know. I saw your video get posted <laughs> on YouTube last night. So, <laughs> and open experts coming from the Digital Center of the Universe. <laughs> That's a lot. Should be the Digital Desert. <laughs> Mason, you asked for GPS coordinates, and you got one lap. So I, I'm just gonna keep bringing up more and more outrageous things to see what chat brings me because chat <laughs> does a great job of bringing me outrageous things. So, okay, and now. Let's move on to the news. This is the section of our show where we talk about the latest things in news. Um, usually about space. It's what cults are calling it space news, even though I don't think there's any space news. There's no space this week. It's but we've already gotten there. So uh, here we go with our news. Um, the first few things we have are just quick, speedy little announcements. Um, iOS 14.7.1 has been released to fix an actively exploited arbitrary code execution bug. So if you're running Apple iPhones, you should probably update your phone uh, when you get the chance uh, to protect yourself. And iPads, because they're the same base OS. Uh, and mm -hmm. there's also a Mac OS release that's also now come out as well. Uh, if you're on Big Sur, there's an update as well, which fixes That's what happens when you have the same operating system across all the things. When you, yeah, we're we yeah. back on this, uh, uh, the, <laughs> iMac is a, the iMac is an iPad with a stand. But yes, um, please update because it's a kernel uh, arbitrary execution, which is not fun. Nope, those are nasty. Or um, if you want to skip this, just go to 15 and go on the betas and live on the edge. Ooh, <laughs> that does not sound like good security advice. <laughs> that's what I'm up to. <laughs> oh, living on the edge. Um, our next one is the old adage proves right again. It's always DNS. Mm -hmm. um, Akamai Edge had a global DNS outage last week, which definitely caused some disruption amongst the global internet. It, it's always interesting whenever you see outages like this because you just come to realize that as, as stable as we think the internet is, it's really held together with people that are screaming at the top of their lungs, duct taping everything together every five seconds to pray that we can get 30 more minutes of the internet. It's so. it's also always really interesting to see like how few services there actually are that kind of the internet needs working. Like if Akamai goes down or Cloudflare goes down, mm -hmm. most of the internet goes down. Like that's scary. It is. It is definitely scary. Yeah, um, huge hookups to the team because it was a major outage. Definitely, it's it's a, it's been a week in hug ops for sure. Um, I did know. I used to know one. Uh, SRE manager who worked at Dropbox, who the, the first assignment for all of his new teams was to read the first three chapters of Bind and DNS because it's always DNS. 
<laughs> um, so it's, not DNS, it's BGP, which is you know, same thing. The, the fact that okay, and the, the 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 hilarious thing is, is that most people will never touch BGP in their life. Okay, yep. if it's actually a BGP issue, it's like oh, there's 30 people on Earth who actually know how to configure BGP. Um, because accurate. like you, yeah, it's <laughs> wow. Like if it's a BGP issue, just sit back and like wait for the apocalypse. Yeah. So. Uh, there you go. Those our, are two speedy items. Those are two next speedy <laughs> items. Our next ones where we go into long winding rants um, comes out of the land of upgrading your database, which sounds to me like like if there's not a horror movie about that yet, there should be. Um, Facebook has migrated from to MySQL eight, and according to this article, they migrated all the way from five point seven to eight, which <laughs> going <laughs> three major versions. <laughs> <laughs> they must Wait, have, they they have was some there, confident engineers. Was there a, was there a seven? No, there was no six or seven. I don't know anything about it. I would assume that there was a six or seven, but apparently okay. we no, we no, don't no, know they... how to do semantic versions again. So, <laughs> okay, well then it's not as scary as it sounded. When I first read this article, it sounded like they went three major versions up, and I'm like, yay! That's, I mean, that's... there there's a big time gap between the two, so it is kind of scary. Yeah, there wasn't a six and a seven. Hmm, but... Really? Okay. But it's like it's, what a twelve year gap. Yeah. Wow. It's interesting more behind why there isn't six and seven. <laughs> uh, yeah, Yogan said no six or seven. Um, also, interesting Facebook side note that I saw is even with all of like Apple's privacy features, where they're trying to like block Facebook ads and stuff, uh, Facebook is up fifty six percent year over year. Hmm. Huh. Which is massive, actually. Interesting. Okay. Um, Shahid asks, do DNS service providers know which sites you visit since DNS queries may not necessarily be encrypted? Um, yes. The, yes, but the service provider doesn't necessarily know who you are. The person you should be more worried about is your ISP because they know who you are because they have your information tied to your IP through your modem. And so we, while we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, actually, in the news, um, if you use Firefox and you're in the US, your DNS your DNS will be encrypted using DNS over HTTPS. So only the resolver will know what you're asking for, not your ISP. Mm. Uh, and there is a new standard being worked on called Oblivious DNS over HTTPS, which uses a middle ma middleman between the resolver and you, so that no one other than you knows both who you are and what you're asking for. That's interesting. I mean, it sounds cool for security purposes, but it also sounds like it's going to add latency and like i'm never really concerned about my dns provider knowing what i'm going for after but mm -hmm. maybe that's but just I'd, me yeah. i'm more i'm more worried of my isp so actually the fact that cloudflare knows it is quite useful because they can do things like radar and have all those enormous stats about what sites are doing what hmm. interesting okay our next story comes out of the land of probably some of my favorite cloud technologies um Mitchell Hashimoto, who is the co-founder of HashiCorp, has stepped down as his role as co-CTO to integrate back into product and engineering teams as an individual contributor, which is, you know, I can't think of any other times where I've seen this, where I've seen execs go back into product roles. Um, but it kind of makes sense. Like, I, I know a couple of people that work at HashiCorp, and they routinely program, pair program with Mitchell. Um, and it's just super exciting because he's a very talented engineer and... You know, they're, I love their products. HashiCorp is probably one of my favorite companies outside of DigitalOcean. Um, yeah, I thought he, this was totally fascinating. Um, it is. It is. You know, he was originally he was originally CEO, and then like they're, 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 him and Armin have been so far forward thinking. Like they mm -hmm. brought in a CEO that they liked, knowing that they didn't want to be CEOs forever. And then like while Ar while well, I, I, mean, I read the whole article and stuff because it's great. But like while Armin continued to like really ex embrace and go into the CTO role, Mitchell was really missing some of the coding roles, according to the article, and wanted to step back into it. And that's amazing. Like that's really inspiring. Um, I'm curious what that role is. Like when you go from CTO, is, are you are you chief engineer now? I mean, or like principal engineer, senior principal engineer, yeah. staff principal engineer? Yeah. Like where are you at? When I you're... feel like individual contributor probably doesn't actually capture yeah. what Mitchell's going to be doing because he can't be like, no. 
I'm on this random team and, you know, just pulling cards <laughs> off the backlog. And <laughs> yeah. Also, like, like, does he just win all just win all debates? Like, you know. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, I, I was actually really glad that you clarified that he does pair a lot already with people. Because, mm -hmm. like, if he wasn't yes. and he was very much in his CTO role before as a CTO and nothing else, I'd be absolutely no. terrified to have him on my team suddenly. No, if you Absolutely. look at if you look at like the commits on the open source stuff, Mitchell's constantly pushing code. Like one oh, of my cool. one of my ex coworkers from my last job on like in his first like three weeks, like spent two weeks pairing with Mitchell on what is now known as man managed console, the managed console service. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, yeah, it's it's really cool and super inspiring. Just if so, if you ever get really big and become a CEO and you don't want to do it anymore, you can always go back and write code, which is good to know. Yeah. yeah, I'm curious to see if um, we hear these kind of announcements more in the future. Um, I know not everybody, you know, wants to do what Mitchell is doing, but uh, it's pretty cool. It is. So it is definitely next really up is uh, Bezos hits the Amazon warehouse. <laughs> I'm looking <laughs> forward to it. <laughs> That'll be good. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, our next story comes out of Right to Repair. So the FTC has voted. Um, is it the FTC? Did I write that in right? Yep. Now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, that at least this is, no. an, this is mostly based out of the American thing. Um, it's being paywalled. But, this is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> nope, not today. <laughs> uh, the <laughs> FTC has announced that we, you have the right to repair your devices. So this has been a long going battle between tech and consumers and not even tech, but like the automotive industry where they require such stringent requirements to be able to repair your devices that basically we just throw away our stuff now instead of getting them fixed. Like when you break a screen on an iPhone, they just give you a new iPhone instead of fixing it. Um, so the FTC has unanimously voted to allow people the right to repair. This has been a big fight. For a very long time and i'm glad to see it's going the way that it's going yeah i saw a laptop shared yesterday about like very along these lines of this framework laptop mm -hmm. where you get to mm -hmm. repair everything oh that looks cool yeah, yeah. tractors um, yes open experts says tractors that was a big one it really was affecting the um the agricultural industry a lot because like these okay. these half a million dollar tractors that that uh are used to harvest our crops you know, if, if the circuit board or anything were to break on it, um, like they had to take it into the manufacturer, they were not allowed to repair it. Whereas that doesn't sound like what you, what you think of when you think of a farmer, farmer, the tractor breaks, the farmer fix the tractor. Like, mm -hmm. at least in my mind, I grew up doing this kind of stuff. So, uh, yes, it's a big thing for the automotive, specifically the agricultural thing. So it's yeah. definitely going the right way. Oh, I did this not realize, I didn't realize like the far, farther reaching. It reaches, I reaches mm -hmm. very far. I thought it was like, oh, I can fix my iPhone. Maybe if it, own, if, so. it, if it has a warranty, it, you mm -hmm. like this is this is basically where you're you're not going to avoid the warranty by trying to repair it. You know, which is nice. That is good. Uh, how much are these laptops, Chris? Uh, looks like nine ninety nine, seven forty nine, and nine ninety nine. Okay. I work at a DIY. You know, the whole the whole idea is that it's a computer you can repair yourself, so you might as well build it yourself. Save mm. two hundred bucks. Pretty much, yeah. I yeah, don't know, I, but I mean, like, do you, do people DIY laptops that often? Like, no, because laptops no. don't aren't very rarely DIYs. It's just kind of the first. Yeah, this is kind of cool. I like the idea of a DIY laptop. I also right. stopped building PCs. So the really cool <laughs> thing I, I want to highlight here, um, you may see there's a QR code and everything. Every single component has a QR code on it that goes to a guide with how oh. you can upgrade it, how you can repair it. That's so rad! Oh my it's gosh. Brilliant. I just, I, you just sold me <laughs> with that part. <laughs> uh, if you saw the left here, these two little kind of brick things with like connectors on the end. Those are your adding cards. So that's like your USB port or your mm -hmm. HDMI port. Mm. It's all just so modular. It's brilliant. And it's, uh, looking at, I saw some of the reviews yesterday. It's basically as thin as a MacBook. Wow. But completely modular. Hmm. I was told that was impossible. If it yes, was, it was like, like by um, mm -hmm. Apple. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've been lied to. Tune in next week to see Chris build a laptop. No, no, no. We're we're doing it now. Go get the company card, and we'll order a bunch right now. Yeah, no, <laughs> one for each of us. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Uh, all right, our next new story comes out of the land of really old email apps. Mm. So I might be the only one that cares about this, but some of my other. I mean, I used to be an Android user, but fellow Android users may remember the email app K9. 
which is named after Doc, the, the dog in Doctor Who. Um, and it is a just an email application that was used for used on Android. I really liked it because back in my university days, I was you know that person that encrypted all their emails with PGP, and this was like one of the only apps that allowed you to actually do this. Um, it, but it's the first release after a very long hiatus. Um, I could not find out how long the last one had been, but like I was under the impression that K9 was dead. Um, but it's not. It came back. So if you're looking for a nice little email app on your Android phone, because I believe it's Android 6.0 and up only, um, and you just need to PGP sign all of your stuff, or is it GPG? It's GPG. Oh, it's GPG for email. PGP is the <laughs> other one. Uh, that yeah, th that is the left. dumbest naming. That's the dumbest naming <laughs> schema on the face of the planet. Um, so uh, oh, no, it's PGP. Open oh, it PGP. is PGP. Dang yeah. it. Okay. Uh, is it similar to Tuda or Proton Mail? Um, yes, I think this is the precursor to them. This is old. I was using this app back in like 2012, sending emails. So like it was, it's old. Um, but yes, it allows you to do lots of cool stuff. It's a really neat app. I liked it. Are they full, are they full time maintaining this? There's the Sheenus um, Liberia Pay thing here. It mm. gets 700 euros a week. A week? That would imply that they're full time maintaining this. Maybe they just brought it back. That's kind of interesting. That's cool. That is cool. Huh. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. It Get seems like on. a really niche little app, but I'm all for it. It is. It was really cool. It's nostalgic for me at this point. Like, I, I have an iPhone now, so I'm not going to be downloading it. But, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. And it's cool to see old projects that, like, kind of, like, pave the way kind of make a comeback. <laughs> so. For sure. Our last story today comes out of acquisitions. So after a year after the announcement, Salesforce has completed the acquisition of Slack. Salesforce claims they are hoping to use this uh, acquisition to create the digital headquarters. So Slack is no longer its own independent company. It is now purchased and owned by Salesforce. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What are we thinking? Like a Microsoft Teams setup coming in? Good grief. I hope not. <laughs> I actually think they'll be pretty okay with. I don't, I don't think they'll destroy Slack. Like that would be so risky to try and do anything dramatic with it. I think we we'll just start to see more integrations. You know, more first-party apps for Salesforce, that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm very emotionally attached to Slack. Uh, I use it for work. I'm on a big. Uh, developer Slack in Denver, where a lot of my social life gets organized. And when they changed their logo a few years ago, it took me many months to like come to terms with it. <laughs> so, and I don't think I'm alone. I think a lot of people um, use Slack a lot, especially now that lots of tech workers are working remotely. Like that's often the place where you you get a tremendous amount of your work done. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's all it's always great to dedicate 16 gigs of RAM to one application. You love, you love to do it. <laughs> oh, did I did, did I say the quiet part out loud? <laughs> yeah, I whenever I look at my battery, it's like uh, yeah. significant usage uh, by Slack. <laughs> I'm not sure I, I quite it. have the uh, same level of emotional attachment as you do, Kim, but I definitely have that emotional attachment to the Discord customer emotes. Well, just oh, customer emotes in yeah. Slack. Like, like, that's how oh, I live my life oh, now. Same. I saw we okay. counted how many custom ones are in the DO Slack. <laughs> It's, yeah, we're we're, we're slack. We've only probably? got like like yeah, we we've only got like what is it like? I thought it was four thousand. Oh, well, we're slacking. I've seen some with like four forty thousand. We've got to yeah, we got to pick we're it slacking up now. We used to be at the top of that game. So. <laughs> uh, oh my goodness! Awesome. <laughs> well, we that said, is we all. That's like a small number. It's like a two hundred eighty meg zip if you try to download them. <laughs> that's a lot of emotes. <laughs> Can you download them all? Yes, we have a script that does it. <laughs> mm. I bet Classic. that makes the people at Slack really happy. Oh, yes, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, it's multi-threaded it. as well. <laughs> <sighs> okay, well, that's all we have time for the news today as we move on to True or False. This week, we have a fun theme. So if you're not aware with this, we do a game called True or False every week. If you go to Kahoot.it and enter this code and you win first, you get Sammy stickers. <laughs> I will eat, I will send you some Sammy stickers. So this week's theme is C theme, Ooh. not C the programming language. C the the, the water. 
<laughs> the water. Okay. Yes, the wa the water part. So everyone, go to Kahoot.it and input seven two one four nine nine eight to get in, and then we will start the game in a little bit. Right after Kim does our word of the day or word of the week, I guess it's the week. So yes. Kim, what is our word of the week? Word of the week is numeronym, um, and huh? a numeronym is a number based word. And the way that you create a numeronym is you keep the first letter and the last letter of the word, and then you count the numbers in the middle and replace those middle uh, letters with the number. So an example of this is A11Y. Uh, it's pronounced A11Y, and that's a numeronym for uh, accessibility. Uh, another uh, good tech numeronym is Kates, uh, so K8. S and that's for Kubernetes. Um, another good one, O11Y is for observability and I14Y is for interoperability. So <laughs> they are, certainly are no shortcut to say out loud. <laughs> no, it, 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 the I14Y seems like it takes, takes just as much time to say as interoperability. Well, apparently I can't say it, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, so the, uh, yeah, Mason actually said, uh, "Would you talk about uh, what the heck is a eleven Y?" Um, and I was like, "Oh yeah, absolutely." So, uh, numeronym. I think that's how you say it. Um, but uh, that's what they are. Yes. Everyone, try to say it five times fast, and let us know. <laughs> let us know how many times you mess up. <laughs> okay, we're going to give it another about 30 seconds if you want to join in. Remember, if you join in, you have a chance for winning a Sammy sticker pack um, that we will mail to you. You'll just email me at the end. And uh, if you end up joining in late, you can always jump in. You might not get to answer all the questions, but if everyone's doing really bad like they did last week, then you might still have a chance to win. Hmm. So, and, and also, if you've never played Kahoot before, it's not just about get. It's going to be a true or false quiz, but it's not just about getting it right. It's about being fast. The faster you answer, the more points you get. Unless you're wrong, then you get zero. Yes. So <laughs> it's going to be pretty interesting, and we're going to go ahead and start in about five seconds. This this I'm last delay. To stock images here. <laughs> the stock oh, yeah. images are, the, are my favorite part now. Well, it's sea animals. I was able to. Uh, I was able to get a lot of cool stuff. Here we go. First true or false C edition. Three, two, one. Da -da -da. Sharks have bony skeletons. Is this true or is this false? Do right. sharks have bony skeletons? Trying to everyone, remember. Everyone, we're going back school. to <laughs> we're going back to fourth grade biology class. Everyone. <laughs> This is false. Sharks do actually do not have skeletons at all. Their entire body is made out of cartilage, very flexible cartilage, so they can move. Very nice. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I paid okay. no attention in biology. Yep. <laughs> and it's going to show today, Matt. Melodic <laughs> Buffalo is up at the top with Social Ooh. Seal and Amazon Zebra and Amazing Goat right behind it. So like here names. we go. Whales have belly buttons. Do whales mm. have belly buttons? We should have our backstage moderator in here. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> she, she swims with all these animals. Like, she every does. Morning. <laughs> yes. We could get an entire. This is true. Yay. Most people got this. Yes. Whales do have belly buttons. They are mammals. Therefore, they were get birthed live, unless you're a platypus. Um, and that means that they have belly buttons. Remember, you have whenever to have we a... talk. An umbilical cord to have a belly button? Yes. And okay. most uh, give live birth. The only one that doesn't qualify is the platypus. And we just, we leave it in Australia where it belongs. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> melodic buffalo, social seals, neck and neck, and amazing goat coming up. But here we go. Next question The Atlantic Ocean is the largest ocean on Earth. Is the Atlantic Ocean the larger, largest ocean on Earth? True or false? Yeah, I kind of prefer the tech quizzes. <laughs> <laughs> this is false. The Pacific Ocean is the largest ocean on Earth by almost 30% more. Dang. Yes. How do we know, how do we draw distinctions between oceans? I actually think that there's like, 
I think like the you can actually like, there's a noticeable change in the difference and in, in the water like one's murky, one's clear mm-hmm. when you see. I think when you fly over them, you can actually see them touching. It's kind of cool. I wish I'd look for that stock photo. Melodic Buffalo, you're on fire with a streak of Ooh. three. Uh, but Amazon Zebra is coming up. It could be anyone's game. The female tiger shark can give birth to between 20 and 80 young at a time. Did you just give away the answer? Is this true or false? Tell me. You said 20, <laughs> not 10. I can't read, Chris. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I know, but when you do I false answers, you change one Chris. number. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's true. Okay. It's 10 and 80. Gosh, everyone over here trying to figure out my what I'm doing on this. Uh, oh, yes, the, the female, is the fe- Yeah, everyone, <laughs> every, stop metagaming it and just be smart and get the answer. Like, uh, That's not the female, how I take quizzes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You're right. The American education system taught us well. You don't have to know. You just have to guess. Tricks. Um, yeah. <sighs> I don't even want to talk about that. Yes, the female tiger shark can give birth between 10 and 80 young at a time, and the gestation period is 14 to 16 months. Oh, so. we have we have some interesting information about oceans in the chat I'd like to call out <laughs> from Samantha. So looks like there's been four oceans. National Geographic decided on those. And on June 8th of next year, we'll get a fifth ocean, the Southern Ocean. <laughs> ah, it it's, like wraps around Antarctica. Mm. Well, I'm learning that Antarctica's melted to the point where we need another ocean. (laughs) Okay, okay. Well, we're we're gonna we're gonna crawl out of this depressing hole and go back into true or false. Killer whales are part of the shark family. Are killer whales part of the shark family? This like rings a very faint bell in my head from again primary school. <laughs> False killer whales. Killer whales are not part of the shark family. They're not even part of. They're not even really whales. They are part of the dolphin family. Ooh. They are much more closely related to dolphins than anything else. Why did we call them that? Because, because we call them killer <laughs> dolphins. <laughs> I do not know. It's. <laughs> <laughs> the naming schema of things in 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 the animal kingdom is hilarious, um, and we'll deal with that at a later date. But oh, we've got a tie. Rap, rapid hamster and social Ooh, seal wow. are tied. I've never seen that before. Next question: <laughs> Up until the 16th century, mariners referred to sharks as sea dogs. <laughs> the best, the best stock photo. I this is the always. best. This is the best stock photo of the day. Um, Can you yes, imagine the but- for of this, how long that must have taken? Like, yeah, get that a dog not- hit by a Oh, yeah, it was a, probably a long photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Up until the 16th century, before the word shark came into the vernacular, mariners referred to sharks as sea dogs. Excellent. Oh, wow. Social seal and rapid hamster, neck and neck. It's going to be, and so is. Like knowing Wallaby, we're all they're all within the top, and I know one of them is not Matt because he's not doing great today. So I'm in eleventh currently. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you need to pay more attention in school. I think I might be lost. I think it was eleven people playing. <laughs> the heart Ooh. of a shrimp is located in its tail. Is the heart of sh- of a shrimp located in its tail? Is this true or is this false? It said somebody's on a five answer win streak, so I feel Ooh. like they're gonna shoot up the leaderboard. Well, it's going to be fun to see. Good fight for some stickers this week. Yeah. This is false. The heart of the shrimp is actually located in its head. Hmm. Did not know that until I started researching. Oh, Rapid Hamster, knowing Wallaby Social Seal, but Rapid oh, rapid Hamster's on answer streak of oh, six. six. Woof, here we go. Next question. The fastest known marine animal is the tiger shark. And this is a marine animal. That means That's- water terrifying if it is the fastest known <laughs> marine animal is the tiger shark is this true this is false the fastest known marine animal is actually the sailfish um which is what it sounds like has a sail it's been clocked in at speeds of up to 68 miles per hour roughly hey. 100 kilometers per hour how big is it pretty big I, cl- I clicked the button too quick. Each whale, sh- okay. Each whale shark spot pattern is as unique as a fingerprint. 
Is this true or false? Each whale shark, which have distinctive spot patterns, are is it as unique as a fingerprint? Also, the stock image is a cahoot. Okay, well, thank you. I'm glad everyone got that. Um, <laughs> don't have to explain it. Everybody got it. Ooh. Knowing Wallaby. Okay, Rapid Hamster, it's going to take a bit, but you can do that's, it. That's quite a bit more difficult, though, to scan compared to a fingerprint, though. Like, you know, yes. if we ever want to do, like, <laughs> fingerprint authentication for whales. <laughs> they just got to roll around. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, roll around. It has to be the size of a warehouse because they're, like, you know, 30 tons. <laughs> Last question. Sharks possess a sixth sense Ooh. to say. Sharks can sense electrical fields emitted by animals in the surrounding water, helping them hunt. Is this true or is this false? Can sharks sense electrical fields emitted by animals in the surrounding water? So this is the only one I've been confident on the answer to. Everyone got it, so I guess everyone knew it. I guess uh, you've all been watching Shark Week. This wasn't even my school education. <laughs> and this was you watching Shark Week, wasn't it? Yes. Well, Mark Robot on YouTube, but yes, Shark Week. Oh, Mark Rober, too. Yeah, he does. Yeah. So, Social Seal. Nice. Number Yogan. three. Congratulations. Rapid Hamster, 7727. Seven, oh, who's it going to be? Nine, Nine out of ten. ten. We have a... The Knowing Wallaby knows the sea stuff, so that's for sure. That's Runners up are Melodic something, I guess, bird, <laughs> and then owl. Um, <laughs> was this... What is number one any of my co-hosts? No. 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 <laughs> Good. <laughs> no. Good, good. I don't know knowing Wallaby, you get to email me at Mason at digitalocean.com. So email Mason at digitalocean.com with your full address. And I'll send you some stickers. Looks like it's Yoginth. Awesome. Sister. Great, great, Yoginth. It's also awesome. great that you won. Uh, yes, email me everything. Like I need your like every full part of it. City, state, postal code. Um, every every time we do this, I get to mail something to another person around the country, around the world, and I get to find out that post is hard. It is. <laughs> it is hard. <laughs> and that is all we have time for today on True or False. Now we're going to move into our lightning tutorial in which Kim is going to talk us about Kubernetes deployment manifest with kubectl or how to generate one. So Kim, take it away. Thank you. All right. Well, yesterday I did a longer tech talk on the topic of Kubernetes deployments. And um, so the, I've noticed this gap when you're learning Kubernetes um, and doing like introductory materials, you often deploy one pod at a time. And I've showed that before um, on lightning tutorials. But when you're actually running workloads in production, you want multiple replicas of things. You want Kubernetes to know if you want three instances of your application running and one of them is down, Kubernetes will spin up another one. And the most straightforward way to do that is with a Kubernetes resource called deployments. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to generate a deployment YAML manifest and uh, get it going in your Kubernetes cluster. So, all right, you can see my screen. I'm gonna bump the size up just a little bit just to show you that I'm connected to a cluster. I'm gonna say cube control get nodes. Beautiful. I'm gonna see, do I have any pods um, running in my default namespace? There's nothing there. And so um, what I wanna do is I could just use commands and do this imperatively and say cube control, create a deployment with a name and uh, some other information in it. What I really want to do, though, is I want to create a YAML manifest so that I can commit that manifest uh, to Git and upload it so I can share it with my colleagues. Like This idea of infrastructure as code um, is important. So that's what I'm going to do. This is kind of a long command, so I, I took notes um, and I'm just going to, oh, that's not helpful at all. OK, let me see if this works. Cool. All right, so to generate uh, the manifest from your command line, you say cube control create deployment, and then you name the deployment. I'm gonna call it example API. And then you say the image that you're gonna pull. And so I have this image stored in the digital ocean container registry, and I'm gonna point to that image. I'm gonna copy that from down here. This is the longest part. And then you want to say to Kubernetes, I don't actually want you to create the deployment and like you like create it in the Kubernetes cluster. So you say, I'm going to do a dry run 
I'm a client. And then you're also going to say, hey, I want this output in a YAML format instead of JSON. And then I'm going to save it in a file called deploy.yaml. Great. So we saw that pop up. And so Kubernetes YAML manifests, they, off, they look like this. Um, we have this type of Kubernetes resource called deployment. Uh, it's got the name example API. It's going to create a set of pods that have this label app example API. You can set the number of replicas. So let's run more than one, let's run four. Um, and then down here, starting with templates, we have information about the containers that is, are gonna be running in the pod. We're pulling this image from the DigitalOcean Container Registry and we're gonna name it example API. And so back to the command line, I'll clear this out. We're gonna say kube control apply the file called deploy. It says that that deployment was created. Let's double check kube control get deployments. Cool, I have a deployment now called an example API. You can see there's four pods running of the four that I want to be running. And if we say kube control get pods, we have all four of those pods running. Um, so that is how you use a Kubernetes deployment. I could show you what's in the application or we could just call it good for now. What do you all think? <laughs> could we try killing a pod to demonstrate that it will just restart? That's a great, great call. Yes. So I'm going to grab this specific pod. It's got a unique hash at the end. And so I'm gonna say cube control, delete. Uh, oh, not that, I want the whole thing. Delete pod and then the entire name of the pod. And if we do get pods and we watch, oh, it happened so fast you couldn't even see oh, it. <laughs> so we killed that pod, but the Kubernetes controller was like, I need four replicas of that pod running. And so you can see here, uh, this pod that's three seconds left, Kubernetes created a new pod. It has a different hash at the end. Um, but that's, that's like one of the beauties of Kubernetes, you say, I want X number of instances running of this application or workload. And if you set it up with something like a deployment, Kubernetes is gonna check and make sure that that's true, so. Yeah, and then you can also extend that with like health checks as well, right? So if it detects that health check's not working, it will essentially delete the pod for you and restart it. Absolutely, you can configure that. So yeah, if your pod is, is sick or uh, just isn't like spinning up properly, Kubernetes can handle that. There's a lot of, uh, ops best practices that have been built into the Kubernetes system that make life easier for people deploying applications. And that's like the whole point. That's why people love the tools so much. So, all right. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> Always love learning a little bit more about Kubernetes every day. I do think that we need a Kubernetes plugin that makes like a re or a screaming sound every time a pod dies. <laughs> <laughs> You might turn it off after a minute <laughs> if that you're running a production fun. cluster. Oh, yeah. before we go on, uh, if you want to see that that full tech talk, you go to do.co slash tech talks. Um, you'll be able to find that. Uh, find that there. Sweet. Got an hour with a lot more information. Fantastic. <laughs> and now we're moving into a section we haven't done in a while, but it's good to have it back. So we're doing Back in My Day. This is a segment where we talk, look back on historical significant events in tech and marvel at just how far we've come. And as always, we love the end of this segment. You've got mail. Because you've got mail. So <laughs> anyway, our first segment comes out of July 15th, 1983, when Nintendo released the Famicom which when ported to North America became known as the NES or the Nintendo Entertainment System. So the Famicom was originally released in Japan in 1983. And then it was ported to North America in 1985, mm -hmm. revitalizing the, the personal home console video game industry that had taken a huge crash in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and that's kind of where why there's a gap between like Atari and Nintendo. 
Oh so. my gosh, I love the colors of that. <laughs> Console. Yes, the fa the Famicom <laughs> the Famicom was super colorful, and and then they really dulled it down for the American audience. Also, this looks nothing like the original NES. Like mm -hmm. the NES mm -hmm. was that gray box with the flip lid, and that 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 was the original Famicom. Um, so yes, if you've ever played Mario, this is where it started. Very At least cool. Mario in that sense, not the Donkey Kong one that was a uh, arcade game. You've got mail. Our next story comes out of space because that's all we do on this show. This is not cloud <laughs> chats. This is space chats. And we just talk <laughs> about space. Um, Apollo 11 was launched on July 16th, 1969. It was on its way to becoming the first ever manned space, mis space mission blah, to the moon. So this is the, um, the space program that allowed us to get people to walk on the moon. And it launched July 16th, 1969. Fantastic. Move on to the next one. I just want to point out that I had no hand in this week's space stuff. <laughs> he did not. No, I actually put them in there because it was some of the only interesting stuff in July. Apparently, a lot of not a fun tech happens in July. So our next one you comes out of me. the land of silicon. And Intel, on July 18th, 1968, so a year before the Apollo 11 was launched, Intel was founded uh, in Santa Clara, California, to build microprocessors. Their first processor, the 4004, or 4004 was released in 1971 for use alongside calculators um and then like this kind of like led to the the you know the silicon fights between IBM's 8080 processor and 8088 processors for IBM PCs and then eventually IB Intel has, a, has emerged victorious in that market i you really don't see or hear anyone using power pc anymore um AMD's making a rise but Intel really did kind of win the uh, the silicon market there for a while, but AMD is definitely coming up, which is pretty cool. It's wild. I mean, so long. yeah, I mean, it's, it's long in like a human lifetime scale, you know, what was this in 1968, but to imagine like how far we've come with microprocessors and computers in general, it's mind boggling. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Open Expert actually says that they loved the 4004, 4, but the text was not possible. It's cool that someone here actually experienced that. Never, <laughs> never in my life had I experienced that. So that's really that's really fantastic. Um, our next story is once again yeah, we're going to space. On July twentieth, nineteen seventy six, <laughs> the first robot Viking One lands on Mars. So the first thing that was ever sent to Mars landed there, and on July twentieth, nineteen seventy six. Yep, cool. looks looks kind of cool. And uh, yeah, space stuff. <laughs> and just to think that now we have a drone flying around on Mars, kind of just having some fun, really. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. It took us 50 years, but now we have an even more expensive robot on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is really cool. Uh, space is interesting. To say the least. And then our last item on July 27th, 1981, Microsoft buys full rights to 86 DOS from IBM. 86 DOS was then renamed to MS DOS, which may be something that you are familiar with. So I was unaware of this that IBM actually was the original creator of DOS, and then Microsoft purchased it and changed it and used it for their operating system. Hmm. I also did not know that. They bought it from this. So it says that they. Bought it for what says fifty thousand dollars. So DOS actually stands for Dirty Operating System. Quick, quick and dirt. Er, yeah. <laughs> for, formerly known as QDOT. Yeah. Yes, it was changed to Disk Operating System, but it was Quick and Dirty Operating System. It was because uh, you have to think about the time back then. Like you would have been, you would have been competing against the like the Unix derivatives. So AT and mm -hmm. Bell Unix. You would have been in, competing against the VAX system. So VAX VMS. And apparently DOS was just like, it was quicker and easier to use because those were a lot more complicated. So quick and dirty cool, is how we got that. So it's but, a, I mean, like $50,000 for what is like essentially the groundwork for yeah. everything. Yeah. Seen. Who, no, no one ever said that Bill Gates paid a lot of money to get where he is today. <laughs> there's, like, there's a really, there's a really funny Simpsons episode when he, Bill Gates is guest stars and he buys out Homer's uh, internet company and he's like, and they, they go in and they just break it all down. It's like, what are you doing? He's like, well, I didn't get this rich by writing a lot of checks. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so that's pretty funny. 
Um, and that's all we have today for back in my day. Okay, so as Open Expert says Gates wrote it for IBM, then bought it from IBM. Oh, okay. Huh. This is what happens whenever we talk about history that is older than well us. us. <laughs> that one's a, yeah. My dad would have just graduated high school at that point. So like I wasn't even a thought back then. And now for our final section where we go around the room and just talk about what's on our mind. So Matt, what's on your mind? You may notice I've got nothing in the dock this week. Um, <laughs> that may be why you got chose first. It may also be because you've never turned on your camera. We'll never know. Ooh. We'll never know. Um, no, my mind has been like, I've been so detached from the world for the last week trying to solve this problem at work. Um, long story short, microservice architecture is a pain sometimes. Um, mm, yes, I have one is. service to generate some content, and I had another service that needed to deploy that content. And making the two Damn services sense. talk to each other is a pain. Um, yep. <laughs> and I was, you know, I went for the really hacky solution. Instead of rolling out like a proper pub sub queue or anything, I solved it by using Postgres and PG Notify. So I'm using Postgres to do a pub sub binary data queue. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know quite how to feel about it, but it works. Right. I feel like when it. Okay, so just. The way that you should always design your microservices is pretend you're the new person coming in in five years from now. What is your first reaction when you see PubSub Postgres? <laughs> yeah. If that I reaction guess. is not overwhelmingly positive, then maybe you might want to read. This. It works. I can, yeah. I can refactor and change it later, but for now it works. Yeah. And it the, yes, the and I can refactor it and change it later is the biggest lie that developers tell themselves along with, I'm going to test it later and I'll write the documentation later. These are all lies, Matt. <laughs> Do not fall into these traps. There's no testing in his repo yet. So once, once I've solved the testing problem, I'll then start to worry about my pub sub cube not being Postgres. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I'm I'm really glad that this sounds like every software project ever. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm just really happy with it. Like, I was shocked by how instantaneous PG Notify is. Hmm. Nice. Like, I mean, yes, it makes sense because it's the database doing it. Like, it's a trigger that instantly fires it. But it like so when you make the HTTP call to the first service, the second service has finished processing the result of the PG Notify call before the re response cycle finishes on the hmm. first service, which is just insane. That's super fast. Hmm. That's pretty cool. Chris, what is on your mind? Yeah, I just threw this on there, as I do. Um, <laughs> I've I've been a big fan. Like I'm I'm pretty heavy in the code, wh whatever. But I've been really big into like these low code, no code solutions. And I know a lot of people have, feel certain ways about them. But I lean low code, not no code yet, because I don't think no code is ready. But uh, one thing that is out, and let me share screen is bubble.io if anyone's seen it it's like a way to make a full app just by creating these prompts in a, in a browser of dragging and dropping ui elements and just saying like oh when this happens then this which is essentially what coding is uh they just raised a hundred million dollars wow. and i feel like wow. low code no code is getting better every day mm -hmm. so just something to keep an eye out my question whenever I see one of these tools is, if I need it, do you still give me access to code? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very true. Because like, I'm uh -uh. fine with using your UI when it makes my life simpler. But when I want to do something complicated, will you let me do it? Yeah. And so far, I've found the answer is no. So that's why I kind of like don't jump all in. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like, I don't know. I, I might even consider that PG Notify thing a low code thing, right? Yeah, essentially. Yeah, definitely. That's it's kind of like why whenever that one time I did Strappy with Chris, I actually really liked it because everything's a crud. Like as Chris and I say to each other all the time, everything's a crud app, and I don't need to I don't need to rewrite this from the ground up every time. Mm -hmm. um, but the the and I think on the one app that we wrote, we had to change like one thing, but it gave us access to code, and like we were able to add one function to do what it needed, and then it just worked. And I'm like, this is brilliant. Like I don't. Mm -hmm. Like the only thing that slightly worries me about that is then you have then you're like 
it's just from the security standpoint that if the, if if there's one like it's kind of like like you know word like WordPress you know WordPress is a is a low code solution and when there's when there's an error it affects everyone so mm-hmm. like if 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 ba- if a bad decision was made in the core code then it affects everyone and this the, the, the range of it of the of the vulnerability becomes larger but I guess that's just like the risk you have to take now for you know yeah I mean for, you talk for about the, for the speed that too. you yeah. yeah no yeah you're 100 it's the same thing as packages like yeah packages do the same thing like left pad. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the security vulnerability in left pad. I'm, I, I know there, ha- there there has to be one, right? Oh, I'm sure somewhere. Yeah, I, 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 the other thing that always scares me about like relying on something like Strappy is just you are then entirely dependent on them if you need to do an update. Like if they release a major release and then that has a security fix in it, you have you're then tied to updating all your code to work with their new major release. Yeah, um, and if you're in a big app, that can be quite a pain, especially if the re- if there was a refactor. Yeah, and, and backporting. Yeah, I mean, it's your trade. You're you're kind of it's a trade off. Every every one of these decisions these days is a trade off, and you have to, I guess, weigh weigh the trade offs on it. Yeah, I think a good solution is to maybe pick apart smaller pieces. Like, I mean, not database. Database is a big part, but like authentication, handing that off and saying, let's try this out, and then maybe payments, because those two I feel like are the most annoying to do. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I never, I will never roll my own payment system. I, I will always use Stripe or or something or something. I will never do that myself. Like that just seems yeah. like such a. I'm terrified of PCI compliance. It, it's one of the few things that scares me. That. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kim, what is on your mind? So yesterday I had my quarterly like meeting with my manager about my goals uh, sort of outside of my core work duties. So that got me thinking about tech is, it's hard to be in tech. You have to keep up. You have to like continually get new skills and and know what's going on in the industry. And it's really hard. And um, my manager, after we set some goals around what I want to learn this quarter, he asked me, you know, how, how can I support you? And it was really like, I need you to help me have time to do that at work. and so, yeah, just keeping that on my mind, and um, yeah, it's 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 hard, uh, but I think it's worth it. So, shout out to Daniel, my manager. <laughs> yeah, he does great. I'm a big I'm a big proponent of if we have to do career in, like development at work, put it in Jira, yeah. put it in your put it like we we actually included it in our quarterly goals this quarter for like as a team planning. It's like if 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 we're going to be expected to do it, then it needs to be a trackable metric. And we need, you're right, we need to allocate time for it. So um, go ahead, go ahead when you're done, write yourself some Jira's to uh, do that. And then that's, that's how it gets done. Yeah, you bet. Mason, what's on your mind? Uh, I am finished unpacking. That Woo-hoo! is nice. I have enjoyed. Oh, yeah. There's books behind you. Yes, there's books <laughs> behind me. Like my bookshelves are looking immaculate. I love them. The trombone is back. Yeah, it, it'll go somewhere <laughs> eventually. Um <laughs> But yeah, I've got my office is all set up. Like the house is just really like we're settling in. Everything's nice. Um, the only thing that irritates me is about once a week I have it. There's an internet outage, and it irritates me. Yeah. La- like that's, that's what you get when you move farther away from society. I mean, I'm not that far from society. Like 20 minutes from the nearest town, but there's just no- and like I'm in a subdivision, so there's people all around me. Um, but like when the internet goes out, it goes out. And then you have to deal with it. And they're doing so much construction around here that it just increases the 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 chances. Because I, I had as as one of as my mentor in college told me, um, and he made it sound like it was a National Geographic special. The only natural en- enemy to fiber cable is the backhoe. And if you've ever lo- if you've ever <laughs> lost fiber cable, just park a backhoe in the vicinity, and within an hour, the backhoe will cut the line. <laughs> um, so if you ever lose some fiber, rent yourself a backhoe. You'll cut it in no time. Cool. Um, and that's what happened. Like they're building a Dairy Queen down the street. Uh, it's like the first fast food in the area. And they cut they cut one of our fiber lines in the area. And I went I went like ha- like I, I like two o'clock to like four the next morning. I didn't have internet. And I was like, ah, oh, this is irritating. So now whenever I do these live streams, I have my phone right next to me. So if I cut out, I can immediately flip on my hotspot and mm-hmm. get back on get back on and continue my job. But Probably. other than that, I'm happy to be uh, done unpacking. And I never want to move again. 
<laughs> I actually, I have two internet service providers now, so that if really like one of them is very good during the day, so I use it for work and for streaming, and then it's terrible at night. I think when everyone's streaming, and so then I have uh, I flip to a different uh, ISP. Hmm. You're the first person I've ever met who's done. I've thought about it because like the, we only like. The thing that stinks about these subdivisions is like when they build them, especially in the states, especially in Texas, one company gets the contract. So I have one option for internet and that's yeah. this um, company that I'm not a fan of. So I don't get to like, just get another provider. Now, what I'm thinking is that whenever Starlink comes available, I may do that and I may go to a dual system to where if yeah. the terrestrial cable internet goes out, I'll switch over to satellite internet. And But is that worth an extra hundred bucks a month for that? For four hours of redundancy we'll have to see lots of, lots I, mean, of I, find I, out. I also have a redundant a sort of redundant system i have a uh, 150 meg fiber line and then a mm. 20 meg copper line that i don't use but in theory if the fiber line never got cut i do have very limited copper connectivity for a while 20 megabyte <laughs> copper line yep what is this 1940 like <laughs> <laughs> well it, it's it's essentially free because we rent the line for the phone anyway so oh. it's like oh. a pound a month more to have a 20 meg connection across it as Wait, well you you have a landline that yes. like that's really okay i didn't know the world still i guess we yeah. get we got we get one phone call a month from my grandma who does not know oh. how to use a mobile phone <laughs> and the rest of the month it's just spam calls but we have to have it for the for grandma once a month it's worth <laughs> it for grandma yeah. I support you that sound, position. You sound <laughs> like my parents. My parents <laughs> still pay for their landline because all of our accounts are tied to it. It's not like we couldn't change those accounts. <laughs> but no, all of our accounts are tied to it. And like you said, they get one call a month from, from like church. And then yep. everything else is spam calls. Like, yeah, I, I never pick it up anymore. Um, but <laughs> I had to help my mom buy um, answering machine tapes. Those were Whoa. actually difficult to locate. Oh, I can bet. imagine, yeah. Like recently, <laughs> like within yeah. the last five years. Within but... the last year, I had to help them by because they haven't even upgraded to a digital one yet. Wow. The world is a strange place. It's a strange place. <laughs> uh, is that all we have for what's on our mind today, everyone? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll move on to our last few segments, upcoming events. And just because I said it's the last segment doesn't mean you get to run away. So stay. Because <laughs> um, every time I say that, we immediately see the numbers drop. And I'm like, no, we still have my joke. And it's funny. So you should stay for it. Um, upcoming event. Chris, this week you're doing a tech talk on Next.js authentication. Tell us about it. Yes. So I'll be doing, uh, it'll be next week, Next.js, um, really great React framework. Uh, and we'll just look at authenticating with email and password and also with a social account. And we'll be using Postgres on uh, like a DigitalOcean Postgres database. Nice. That Sweet. sounds fantastic. We have some very exciting news in the chat. So Sh Shahid has uh, deploying a website and he wants our feedback. <laughs> oh, no. And <laughs> No, we wanted to do this as a segment, but nobody ever submitted their things. Do we still have that Google form? Do we know where it's at? It's, it's <laughs> in our Google Drive, I think. But yes, we should start this segment. Even can we start it next site. week? Yeah, we can do it next week. <laughs> yeah, let's do it next week. I'm, I well, am poking at it, though, and it looks awesome. Uh, awesome. Shahid. Nice yeah. Okay, so... Go. That's, wait, that's some well, good audience retention. Come back next wait, week and we'll look at it. <laughs> no, no, we'll look at it next week, but give like stay on while I grab the Google form and then you can okay. fill it out and then we'll actually check it and we'll get to do it. That's actually um, great. New segment. Yes, <laughs> yes, we had a Cloud Chats rate my site and I had a short link for it, but now I don't know where it's at. Um, um, so... Yeah. Uh, um, oh, yeah. And while you're doing that, let me answer Yoginth real it's, quick. It's, uh, sorry, go Matt. I just dumped in our chat. Mm. In our chat. Did you find the short link for it? Yay! Okay. It works. There it does. It should still work. Yeah. So if you go to do.co slash cloud chats dash rate, you can submit your website and your name, and we will go over your thing. I will also change this real quick. Don't fill out. Yeah, I'm going to add email. So that way we can email you and let you know when you're going to be like when we're going to rate your your um whatever. Oh, I'm, I'm so excited for this now. 
Yes, we've been wanting to do this since like the very beginning, but no one ever responded. So thank you for bringing that up. And this is to everyone in the chat. If you want to have us look over your website on stream and give you critiques on it, please fill out the form at do.co cloud chat slash rate. And then do we have the other, do we have the cloud? Uh, Wait, it's also have it? dash Qs, I think, dash Qs. Dash Qs? Yeah. Okay, and then if you go to do.co slash cloud chats dash qs you can ask us anything Ooh. yes we will answer all questions so we've had these magic links for ages and we just like never really shared them i'm not surprised we got no feedback we shared them like twice and we didn't like, like that was the one tweet that chris sent out that got no responses oh yeah yeah chris we destroyed your metrics and, that one yeah yeah because yeah. chris is oh, so yeah. mm -hmm. chris is so popular everything gets a response and that one didn't and we were like oh no <laughs> yeah uh, so. i was surprised at that one but uh, real quick, let me answer. Yogan uh, says next off in Passport. We won't be using Passport. We'll be using uh, next off .js, the open source package that is specific to Next. Uh, and Magic Link looks really, really cool. Maybe in the future we'll do it, but uh, not for next week. Yeah, awesome. We have new segments. I'm so excited. Yogan's oh, yeah. already got two sites in. Nice. Come back next week and we will review these sites. Yes. We, we will, will be pre-screening them. Yes. So we don't do anything stupid. Yes. <laughs> um, we will email you to let you know that we are doing them. I'll make sure to email you. Wow, we actually finished kind of early today. What's the time? Oh, yeah. It's only six past. Wow. Yeah. The back in my day segment was a little bit quiet. We did like we just kind of read them. Nobody interacted with them that much. So we're back down to the original timings that this show was meant to be. <laughs> I think it was 45 at the start, wasn't it? Uh, I, uh, no. I think, yeah, I think it was supposed to we, we We keep adding 15 minutes every couple times. And uh, all right. All right. Joke time. Oh, we got joke. time for a joke. Okay. Joke. joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, here we go. Joke of the day. Why does C look down on C? Why? Because C has no class. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, witty, good. witty programmer joke. Witty one. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Witty programmer joke. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining Cloud Chats. We'll be back at the same time next week. <laughs> See you later. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>